Uh, some say I've had patients come in a whole food, uh, plant-based diet with severe coronary disease. And uh, one particular patient come to mind, he had poor dentition, so he couldn't eat the raw greens. I put him on the raw smoothies and cold-pressed juices until he was able to get his dentures fixed. But even though he had been on a whole food, plant-based diet, low fat, salt, no oil for three years, he had crushing angelal symptoms. I came and put him on 100% raw with time restricted eating, put him on extra on a compensation, Angela went away. His functional status went up. So, you know, it gets back to an early question that you asked and I addressed. To what extent we underestimate, what extent we overestimate, there's a little bit of both. And, and, and in regards to this question, uh, the answer to that question also is conditional based on the condition of the patient. Um, is heart disease and strokes a genetic disease or a lifestyle disease? And how often is it genetic? You know, I like to say every, G, every disease is genetic, you know, and, and I say that because, you know, there's a genetic predisposition in terms of, 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 of having the underlying genes that are transcribed into the enzymes and other proteins that potentiate these events. So there's a genetic aspect to every disease. Having said that, when we say something, well, this is genetic or that's not genetic, oftentimes when we have a well-defined, you know, genetic disease, quote unquote, we probably have a disease that probably follows for the most part or a significant part, simple Mendelian genetics, as opposed to some other diseases may not follow simple Mendelian genetic rules. And you, know, you may have so many alleles where it's so confusing. One person will have it in the family and you may not get it for a long time. Or maybe some diseases uh, come up with spontaneous gene mutations or uh, some diseases uh, are manifested you know, only through the epigenetics. So the genetic underlying genetic predisposition is there, but the epigenetics may be manifested in certain people in different ways. So the genetic component is, is probably not as clear cut as we like to think of it is. So in answering that question, I think there's a genetic aspect to any disease, and I think uh, an environmental impact also is important. So when I think of an environmental impact, then that gets into things like food and lifestyle. You know, there's emotions and things like that, how well you sleep and so on. Uh, but there's also environmental things, how many chemicals are in your, your environment. Uh, somebody who grew up in the, in the country compared to living in a city I've had patients, uh, one patient come to mind, she, you know, lived in the, in the rural area and they, she was on a whole food plant-based diet. They milked cows and all that stuff. She was healthy. She moved to the city and um, started living life in the city. And she had a lot of chronic illnesses. Now, that's just one example, but it underscores the fact that there are environmental factors and the environmental factors from multiple different sources. The food is a major source but there are other sources of environmental factors that serve to trigger the epigenetic factor that cause bring, bring about these diseases. Um, what is your thought on salt regarding heart disease and strokes? You know, we make a big argument to lower salt and I think, you know, it's a reasonable thing to do. Um, I think that our nutrients by and large should be uh, plant derived. So if you're gonna get a salt, it should be a plant derived salt. Uh, it should be a plant derived nutrient. So that's gonna be the ideal source. So sea vegetables or you know, celery or the like. Having said that, um, I think many of the issues that we have with salt in terms of the high salt diet being a problem, many of the salty foods are also associated with many other uh, preservatives and chemicals and the like. And so we say, well, you know, uh, this person has heart failure and they, um, they had a, a cheeseburger and they had a fish sandwich uh, at the fish store and look at all that salt they had. And that's why they got sick. However, it's not just the salt in that food. There are other things in that food. So, it's hard to tease salt out uh, from other preservatives and chemicals that may be contributing. So that's number one. Number two, most of the salt in these processed foods 
are not a natural salt that's found in sea vegetables or sea salt or the like. These are processed chemicals. They're they're you know, boiled to high temperatures. They're 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 um, bleached. Talcum agents are added, et cetera. So these are different molecules. So they're contributing in a different way. So it's really hard to tease that that um, um, data out because yes, salt can be a culprit, especially the processed salt, but you have other chemicals that are involved most of the time. And so you're looking at a, an additive effect of salt plus other chemical preservatives and toxins that are contributing to the problem that the person's having. So it, it's it's more complex than salt. There are patients I have, and it's it's you know, it's not like you know, very, very, very rare that we have to add salt to their diet uh, because they're very salt deficient, because they're on a very low salt diet. Um, and so we I think we just have to be careful of our recommendation of salt. I'd like people to get it from natural sources. Um, we tend to tell patients not to cook with their salt. If they're going to use the salt, use the light amounts as a as a as a sea salt. We monitor your blood pressure and those types of things. Mm -hmm.